Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Goulder, contributing editor with Tax Notes. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by one of my favorite authors, Professor Allison Christians with McGill University in Montreal. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be here. I wanted to uh, congratulate you on your recent article that ran earlier this month. Um, it's getting a lot of attention, and the timing just couldn't be better. Well, we do think that a lot of governments are going to be looking for some money wherever they can find it. So I guess, uh, you know, this is the time to be talking about uh, innovative or different ways of taxing. Well, you're, what you propose in the article is certainly innovative. And I have to confess that when I first saw the headline, I did a double take because like everyone else in the international tax community for the last year or so, I've been obsessing over the work of the OECD inclusive framework and, and trying to figure out how exactly would pillar one and pillar two work if these were broadly adopted and, and establish a new um, international consensus for how we're going to tax corporate profits. And then I see your headline and you mention pillar three. And my first thought was, oh no, I, I, I missed something. I'm going to have to go back and start reading hundreds of pages of, of materials uh, from the OECD because I totally glazed over pillar three. But, but this is your own idea. This is, let's call it a, um, a stabilizing supplement to what the OECD is proposing, correct? Yeah, that's right. So like you, I've been busy really trying hard to keep up with the OECD work on the digitalization of the economy and the two pillars. And as you probably know, I've been a frequent critic of what's been going on in that project. But right now, it's kind of all hands on deck and you have to work with the infrastructure that you have, not the one you want. And so we have two pillars. Uh, they do different things. But I've been sort of studying for the last year how they interact or if they interact. And I think the idea of the third pillar came to me because I was using elements from both of those two pillars and it just made a lot of sense to make it a stabilizing third pillar. You can't sit on a stool with two legs. And uh, of course, there's also a global public health crisis going on, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that actually features in indirectly to what you're proposing because you're talking about in the third pillar, a global excess profits tax. And, and, and those are, that's a quirky tax to be talking about. It's a, a bit of a relic from a bygone era, yet it seems very timely and specifically well tailored to exactly what's going on in the world today. So it's sort of a blending of things that are very old and very new. So, so let's back up a little bit before we get into the granular aspects of, of, of your article. Uh, an excess profits tax, when I first explain it to somebody, their immediate reaction is that it somehow feels redundant or duplicative because unless you're a tax haven, almost all countries right, already have a corporate income tax. So if you already are, are, are extracting a tax on capital returns at the entity level via the corporate income tax, why then would you need this extra thing that kind of feels like a, a surtax really? But they're not duplicative, are they? And they're, they're, they're not redundant. Uh, that's right. I think, uh, well, we for sure we're going to see a lot of corporations are not going to have to pay a corporate tax in the coming year because they're not going to be profitable. And I think a lot of firms are going to be in a situation where the corporate tax is not doing much of anything uh, except uh, carrying losses forward for a while. Uh, but then again, there's going to be some firms that are in a moment where the economy is broken. The economy is really broken, but it is going to work to the fiscal uh, or the financial advantage of some firms. And that's really what the excess profits tax is trying to get at. I actually really like the OECD's term for this. When they were discussing this, they talked about super profits. Um, and I actually like that a lot better. It's not a great acronym, right? Like a super profit taxes uh, uh, whereas a, <laughs> a, an excess profit tax a global excess profits tax gets us a gap tax but the idea is just the economy is broken in a fundamental way uh, everything is turned upside down um, who stands to make a profit in this economy that is the is the function of, a, of the brokenness of the mm -hmm. market and not uh, from their own advantage their own innovative creative uh, business advantage but rather just this brokenness this market brokenness 
So I would just say, it, it sounds old, uh, an excess profit tax sounds old. It sounds like something you could throw about 100 years ago uh, in the mix of a world war. But actually, I think it's of a piece with the kind of idea that some firms um, benefit from market conditions that are that have nothing to do with their uh, business decisions and so you can liken it to by a different name you know a resource rent tax is sort of the same idea uh, you know in the good years of when the market inexplicably you know kind of explodes uh, there's the resource rent tax in many years it doesn't get used at all and in some years uh, it will get used but I would even connect it then to pillar one Pillar one talks about routine and residual uh, profits. You know, what is a residual profits? Well, it's the idea is it's something that is the, the value added by the particular business acumen of the firm. Uh, and some part of those residual profits we're looking at for redistribution through the OECD digitalization project. Why are we doing that? Well, one explanation is, oh, well, because, you know, old nexus rules don't work and we have to mm -hmm. give a new nexus. But another reason we're doing that is because we understand that we don't have a word for the value that's being created in countries that are contributing to this innovative uh, digitalization industry. We don't have a word for that, so we don't have a way to tax that. And so when you talk about residual profits and then you start ca carving out a slice of that, you're thinking, okay, th this, this piece of the residual profit, the one that we're going to redistribute is somehow it's in the wrong place. The value isn't correctly articulated. And I think an excess profits tax is doing a very similar thing. It's of a piece to those other ideas. And intellectually, that's I know it's a little bit much, but what is really the difference between an excess profit, a super profit, a monopoly rent, a resource rent, and then this little piece of the residual profit in a digital firm that is not created by the firm itself, but is created by the market that creates the conditions for that firm to thrive. So does, does the tax have almost a quasi punitive nature to it? I mean, uh, you're, it doesn't tax a company that was smart or efficient. It sounds like you're trying to develop a tax that is, is, is targeting companies that were just too lucky at the wrong time. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we should attach anything pejorative to it. I think it's more a reflection on the market than the firm. So when the market is uh, broken and a monopoly uh, exists, that's not the firm's fault. Every firm would like to be a monopoly. That's the nature of the business. I mean, of course, I want to be the only me there is. I don't want any competition because I'm great the way I am. I'm, I want everybody to buy my products, right? So that's the natural uh, uh, inclination of the firm. But the market, a uh, uh, perfectly competitive market, there would be no monopoly and there would be no excess profit. It's the failure of the market that makes us say, okay, we need to fix it. And so there, I think we can liken it um, to other taxes that are thinking about failures, such as, for example, the failure to internalize ex certain externalized costs. So there I'm talking about a carbon tax. Like mm. there's not an economist in the world that won't say that you need a carbon tax, not because people are doing a bad thing, we're doing a, a bad thing maybe, but it's because the externalizing the price of carb, the, the cost of the consequences of carbon on society while internalizing the profits is just an economic error. We need to just fix that error. And it's not, the firm isn't doing something bad by not, uh, you know, internalizing those costs. They're just following the logic of what the market has valued. And the market has not valued, you know, uh, has not put a price on that externalized future cost of carbon. Um, so it's the same idea. So it, you could think of it as punishment, but to the extent it's punishment, it's, it's, it's a punishment of our collective inability to create a functioning market or sustain a functioning market. And it's not a punishment of a firm at all. I wanted to ask you about the temporary nature of these taxes. As we mentioned before, we, we've seen them about 100 years ago. Uh, the United States had one during the war years, World War I, World War II. And, and if I'm correct, these taxes fell out of favor very shortly after the war has ended. Why is it, because what you've just described makes all the sense in the world, it seems like a great tax. Why is it that they sort of um, recede from public view once the crisis is over? Yeah, well, I think there's a, 
we really would need a historian to really give us the big picture on this, but I would say there's a couple of ideas here. Well, one is name the tax that Americans like. I'll, I'll wait. Right, you, you can't, right. So any tax that you can get rid of will be got rid of. Um, and then if you think about the taxes that uh, say, you know, uh, survived uh, their temporary nature, because in, the income tax was also supposed to be a temporary measure at one point, uh, you know, so let's not forget that those were war taxes as well. But the income tax survived uh, and the social security uh, tax, the payroll tax, which was created later, also survived. And why did those survive? Well, uh, historians will give us different ideas, but certainly with the Social Security, we it's clear the, uh, the idea was you peg it to the benefit and then people will never be able to destroy that tax, right? And with the income tax, it's the idea that, well, if you don't have income, you don't pay it. And so that's uh, the ability to pay notion is so powerful. It's such a powerful um, emotional uh, emotionally satisfying uh, explanation for how a tax should work. Those with ability should pay, those with great ability should pay more. And an excess profits tax by its name starts thinking, okay, well, when the market is fixed or we go back to normal, whatever that looks like, well, we don't need this because now the market isn't uh, broken anymore, it's, it's functioning. Now, you know, these are the stories we tell ourselves. I mean, we're obviously wrong about that all the time, right? Like we were wrong about the market being you know, perfectly competitive in 2008. We were really, really wrong about that. Um, and it, it crashed and we were wrong in the seventies and we were wrong in the thirties and, uh, or 1929. And so we've been wrong many times, but there's this idea of there's something like a normal amount of wrongness, uh, a normal amount of sort of market failure that we tolerate with sort of right, a combination of regulation and taxation. And, but when the whole thing goes, uh, completely wrong. We can all look around objectively and say, like, this is really broken, that we can see the need to, um, you know, understand that these things have long-term consequences and we can't just sit by and we can't regulate them away. We've got to figure out how to, um, to incorporate that into a tax system. Well, all right. Let's, let's say I'm a multinational corporation and I'm trying to figure out if I would be subject to a excess profits tax computationally, uh, what's going on? What does the tax base look like? I mean, how do you differentiate between uh, a super profit and an ordinary profit? Because the one, the latter would presumably be exempt. Yeah, exactly. So this is where the OECD's pillar one, you know, starts to, it starts to come in handy having studied that, right? So those of us who've been studying pillar one have been saying for quite a long time, well, how are you going to draw the line between routine and non-routine profit? And um, I think it's safe to say, it might be a little controversial to say that economists cannot draw that line. We all know that economists cannot draw that line. It, it defies the drawing. Um, I've said it before, I've said it in different places, but you, know, you just simply can't take the dollar and, and refragment it. You can't take something that's the product of multiple inputs uh, and then fragment it out and say what it belongs to. So it's really hard to draw that line. And that tells us that we're going to draw a political line. We're going to make a compromise and we're going to say, we're going to use some economic studies and we're going to use some estimates to try to figure out what's normal. And in an excess profits tax, we're going to call that the normal routine. And in pillar one, we're going to call that the routine profits. Uh, so we have normal and routine kind of as cognates in this world. And then in the OECD framework, in the digitalization project framework, we have this excess, which is called non-routine or residual. And that doesn't mean that the market's broken in the OECD model, although one might say some part of it does mean the market is broken. We need to fix where value is being um, allocated under that model. So the, it, when we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the construction of this base? So there's a political decision that's going to be made between routine and non-routine. We can see it in the OECD's um, calculation where they suggest, you know, what percentages it might be. And then uh, tax notes reported on um, a report by KPMG that looks like a transfer pricing study, really, uh, which they call an economic study, where they examine the returns to firms and they come up with some different scenarios and they come up with some numbers and give us what they consider to be routine and non-routine. And then you go a little further and you see some researchers have also looked 
at this, and they've uh, proposed some numbers. So in the column that, uh, that uh, my co-author and I wrote for Taxnos, we took one of those studies, and they showed that the routine looks like 8% on average. Uh, the non-routine looks like 14%, so together that's 22%. So we just say, okay, very conservatively, let's assume that 14% uh, non-routine, or residual profit, you know, we'll assume none of that is the result of market failure. I don't actually think that's correct. I think some of it is the result of market failure, but we'll be conservative. We'll assume none of it is. And we'll just take that 22% and we'll say that's the political compromise that we've come up with so far as to what is sort of a normal average ongoing. So if you are well above 22%, then that starts to look like excess. Why not? That's just a place to start, but we understand it's a political compromise. It's a political statement, not an economic one. And these rates that you're mentioning, they would be uniform uh, across the economy. You wouldn't have one set of rates for, say, the pharmaceutical industry and one for the automotive sector, right? Well, you know, I, fortunately, I'm not in charge of the universe. So if you ask me, I will say I look at that KPMG study and they say it's cross sector, cross industry, cross country. Uh, and, but they do break it down and you can see some variation. So I wouldn't mind if the policymakers of the world decided we do need to break that down into industry. I mean, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I think the key here is that you need to know which industry you're in. And so for some firms, well, which industry are they in? Are they in communication? Uh, are they in uh, delivery like Amazon? Uh, you know, which, which industry is it in? Is it about, uh, is it, delivering services to people? Is it delivering stuff to people? Um, is it doing something else uh, entirely? Uh, it, some of this, Google is doing a lot of different things, right? So I could see there being a discussion about that. And in the interest of not having time to get everybody on board, uh, you could just go with that KPMG slash, um, you know, other research studies and the OECD's own um, estimates to kind of hover around uh, a solid number across the board. So you say in your paper that it would be problematic if this was done at the national level, that there are these imperfections with um, taxing capital income at the national level. And, and if you try to do this with an excess profits tax, all the old defects of the corporate tax would be baked into an excess profits tax. And since you can't do it then, or you shouldn't do it at the national level, it has to be done at a global level. Um, harmonized, coordinated internationally. That's pillar three. And, and you need a, a project like the OECD's Inclusive Framework to sort of uh, be the springboard for something like this. Can you explain a little bit more about why this would not really be ideal as a unilateral level? Say, say France adopted one of these, yeah. like they adopted the digital service tax. And everyone's saying, well, we're not sure how well that's going to work. Yeah. Why can't a country just do an excess profits tax as a one-off? Oh, I think uh, con some countries could certainly do an excess profits tax as a one-off. I think the U.S. probably can do it. But why? Um, it's because the U.S. Uh, ability to collect tax information on its firms is extremely sophisticated. And that's not the case for other countries. And so I'm going to reach out of the digitalization pro project for a minute and say, look, there's a tool out there that the OECD helped bring into existence, which is country by country reporting. And this tool uh, erases intercompany, um, you know, information asymmetries, right? So it erases some of the information asymmetries that a lot of countries have with the uh, firms. And it also makes firms more coherent, consistent in their reporting up the chain. So, you know, just using that resource, using that tool, it's there. The OECD is collecting information on firms on a global basis. So global, basically global consolidated tax information. That's gonna be far more useful to understand whether there's a real profit. Because if you don't have that, not maybe for the US, 
But for other countries, if you don't have that country by country report, then you're just looking at your local firm uh, as a subsidiary, the story they're telling you. And then that draws in, that bakes in all of the problems that we have with information asymmetry and transfer pricing and all that stuff. But if you can use those resources that are at the international level already, if you can use the closest thing we've got to global consolidated reporting, then it's going to give you a more accurate picture of, well, which firms are actually in this position where they, in fact, do have a super normal profit now. Um, and you could also use that information not just to pick a percentage, uh, as I've suggested, but you could also do the other kind of excess profits tax base, which is look at the year over the years, and you could isolate which firms um, now have profits well in excess of what they had before. So you could do a different kind of a system with the CBCR, uh, country by country reporting, than you could do with local reporting in, for, for a lot of countries. Not all, but for many. Okay, Allison. Now we've identified what is uh, an excess profits. We figured out the base and how we're going to tax it. Uh, who gets to collect the money? How do right. you apportion this, this amount of money that's being taxed? How do you apportion it? Because one of the whole purposes of the BEPS project was to respond to the interests of, of source countries, or now we're calling them market jurisdictions. They're maybe not exactly the same thing, but we'll just use them interchangeably for this exercise. Uh, they felt very hard done by the old, uh, well, the, the, the existing rules for permanent establishment and arm's length transfer pricing. One of the whole points of BEPS is to to do something so that those countries have, have, have um, more robust juridical taxing rights. How do you deal with apportionment? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think, so really here is the maybe the most difficult and, and also possibly uh, most interesting aspect of, the, of a gap tax, really. And that is, if it's a transition tax, a temporary tax, uh, then it's a, it's a tax with a purpose. So the purpose is to uh, respond to a market that's broken. And why is the market broken? Well, it's broken because the world is uh, facing an unprecedented um, health crisis. And in some countries, let's face it, they don't need a gap tax to deal with the, with the problem because they'll deal with it in whichever way they have because they have resources. But in other countries, other countries are already overwhelmed by the financial needs to respond to COVID-19. So I think that there's, it shouldn't be too controversial. I think it will be controversial to say this, but it shouldn't be controversial to say that obviously the inclusive framework was set up uh, and, and doesn't have much of a mandate other than to wait for the OECD to the secretariat to give it the proposal and then decide whether uh, there's consensus or not. But instead, the inclusive framework could give this as a mandate to the OECD secretariat and say that here, many, many of the members of the inclusive framework are in a situation where they're overrun with uh, budgetary problems, uh, debt and new spending problems, existing debt and new spending problems. And a uh, gap tax is, uh, if not uh, a solution, it's at least a nod in the direction that the problem is universal and so should the solution be. And so the inclusive framework, uh, you know, is if, if nothing else is positioned with an ear at the OECD, and it should have a mouth at the OECD as well. And I think this is where the political decision about how you collect that tax and how you distribute it comes in. I just want to add one little technical point to that. Uh, here, we'll finally pull in pillar two. So pillar two envisions that, you know, there's a, an idea that if one country doesn't use its taxing power, that another country has, has the backup uh, source jurisdiction or residence jurisdiction can uh, do backup taxation. And I think this is the idea that um, should carry through to the gap tax. That is, um, you would think if you're using CBC reporting, then the gap tax is probably being collected at the parent, at the level of the parent. But if the parent country doesn't want to tax, it should drop down the chain. Uh, that's how pillar two kind of envisions the world. And so we'll use that idea first, um, but the distribution then I think has to be mandated by the inclusive framework and should be mandated as a, uh, a global, uh, global solution for uh, the pandemic. 
How do you feel about earmarking the proceeds of an excess profits tax? Uh, in, in doing some research uh, for, for this interview, I stumbled upon this piece where a, a writer was arguing to have a, an excess profits tax in the U.S. specifically to bail out uh, the Postal Service, mm. mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting because that sort of invokes issues related to Amazon and, and, and so forth and who should pe be paying for this door-to-door um, -door delivery of things. But we won't get into all of that. H how do you feel generally about earmarking Receipts. Yeah. Well, I mentioned Social Security before. So we know that earmarking can be a powerful um, emotional tool or instinctive tool uh, to help explain what it is that we're doing with a tax. But I think here, you know, my sympathies lie with the Postal Service. I understand it is much beleaguered at this moment and I, I get it. But my sympathies lie, I think, far deeper with the mass migration event in India that resulted as a result uh, that resulted after people fled the cities once it was locked down and they had no jobs, no money, no resources, and no bus service to go home. You know, my sympathies lie with the places in the world where people are in crisis right now, um, and I think earmarking to crisis is hard. I get it. Not everybody can turn their sympathies to migrant workers or uh, internal migrant workers in another, in a foreign land, especially now that we seem so even more distant perhaps uh, without travel, right? And I understand that. So I think earmarking is one of those things that, again, it's a global uh, decision-making process that has to go into that. Would I personally uh, support it? Yeah, if the inclusive framework members decided that the GEP tax money should be 100% used to purchase PPE and distribute it to those on the front lines in the neediest countries, I would not be adverse to that. Uh, you know, does that make economic sense? Like, do you raise a GEP tax, which is supposed to be market fixing? Do you raise it for the purpose of the health, uh, the health needs of the poorest countries? I don't know if there's an economic argument there. I think there's a real um, a, a need-based argument there, an normative-based argument there that a lot of people will simply not accept. Um, but I think, look, until we get the pandemic in control everywhere, we will have it in control nowhere. So I think that's for earmarking to the pandemic. The pandemic is why I'm proposing the gap tax with my co-author. And the pandemic is the reason that countries are in really bad shape right now, uh, ever more than, than they have been before. So earmarking to resolve that problem doesn't make, uh, it doesn't maybe make economic sense, but it, it makes policy sense. Allison, I want to thank you for writing this article and for publishing it with us. Uh, our Tax Notes readers have really enjoyed it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon when you come back with the Global Excess Profits Tax Part 2. I look forward to it as well. Thanks so much, Bob.